Um, another great advantage is that unlike VIMP, which is a randomization technique, we can actually study uh, minimal depth. And what, we'll, what I'll show you is that one can actually work out the distribution so that you can define a thresholding value to define a variable as being informative. Another uh, very useful feature is that it's not reliant on the Monte Carlo scheme that's used to grow the tree. So in random forests, we use bootstrap data, but suppose we don't actually want to bootstrap the data. Suppose we want to change the bootstrapping scheme. This has an implication for VIMP since computationally what happens with VIMP is that um, it's actually computed almost for free. Because you have this out of bag data, when you grow a forest, you can compute an out of bag ensemble. And so right away you can immediately calculate prediction error and you can immediately calculate um, the VIMP. But as soon as you start to fool around with the, 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 um, the technique for resampling, then it may not be computationally simple to actually compute um, VIMP. And so computationally, that's an issue. And it applies to force regardless of the outcome. In fact, if you look at this previous tree, I said this was a survival tree, but you really couldn't tell that this was, this was a survival tree, right? It's just splits left and right, but there's no outcome on that. Minimal depth doesn't use that information. The outcome is actually used to construct the tree. Okay, so here's um, a little bit of distribution theory. Um, so what, I've, what I'm showing here is the density for the minimal depth um, as this product. And um, I'll, just, I'll just highlight a few things that are important. One is that there are three quantities of relevance here, pi, theta, and L. So pi is the probability that if you have a variable, it splits at J, it's a conditional probability. Theta is the probability Sorry, pi is probably that it, it's a candidate variable for splitting. Theta is the, is the probability that given that the variable was selected as a candidate variable, you actually split on it. And L are the number of nodes at a given depth, okay? So if you have these three quantities, you can actually write out the density for minimal depth. Um, I think if you, if you look hard enough, you might be able to convince yourself that this first term is really sort of measuring the probability um, that the variable V is not split at a depth less than D, whereas this, this, this term here is measuring the probability that it eventually, that it does split at depth D uh, amongst one of the LD nodes at that depth. Now for this, this uh, distribution result to hold, there's, this is the second part. Um, the, the key is that these values, pi, and theta must not be dependent on the terminal, on the node of interest. They can only depend upon the variable and the depth of the variable. Um, and so that assumption um, could be satisfied in many ways, um, but one of the most fruitful ways to, to sort of get at this is to, to, to think about what if V is, is a noisy variable, okay? So suppose that V is completely unrelated to the outcome. Um, then it turns out that under these two conditions that um, both pi and theta would be independent of the terminal of the node that we're looking at T. Um, and it also turns out that condition um, two will automatically hold in a sparse setting. So if you, if you have a high dimensional sparse scenario, then condition two holds. And condition one will hold if M divided by P goes to zero. So what's P? P is the number of variables and M here is M tri. Okay, so this is the number of candidate variables that are chosen to split a node when growing the random tree. So for example, if you choose m equals square root of p, then this would hold. In fact, square root of p is one of the classical default m tri settings used. It's used in survival settings and classification settings. However, as I'm gonna argue, this is actually way too small. Square root of p value is way too small to be effective at high dimensional scenarios. Uh, <coughs> um, so, under um, conditions one and two, a nice simplification occurs. So you get pi times theta equals one over p, and, uh, and presto, you get a very nice description for the null distribution. So if v is noisy, it's unrelated to the outcome, and you know the um, number of nodes at any given depth, then the probability that the minimal depth equals a value can be written out in this closed form expression. Um, all you really have to know is the number of nodes at a given depth, which we can calculate by using forest average values. So once you know the density, you can do all kinds of things with it. So for, for one thing, we, we define a thresholding rule. 
right? So we call this minimal depth threshold. If you take the expected value, the mean value under this distribution, then simply compute the minimal depth. This is the forest average minimal depth. So each tree will give you a minimal depth value. Just average them out over, let's say, 1,000 trees, if you have a forest made of 1,000 trees. And then just check whether this value is less than the mean under this null distribution. If it is, that's your variable, select it. Okay, so it's a very simple tool for um, selecting variables. Okay, so um, I, I want to illustrate this um, using um, some data that's related to long-term survival and uh, ECG. So electrocardiography um, at, at many hospitals, like the Cleveland Clinic, is, um, is a, uh, a non-invasive diagnostic tool for assessing the functionality, dysfunctionality of the heart. So it's a technique for uh, monitoring the electrical activity of the heart. So, um, you know, as the heart um, pulses through its cardiac cycle, um, the upper chambers, the atria, and the, the lower chambers, the ventricles depolarize and they repolarize. So it's kind of like its own little engine. It has its own little electrical box. And these electrical signals um, send out a wave over the heart, which can be collected by placing electrodes near the heart and through the body. Um, so the schematic on the bottom shows placements of electrodes in what's called a 12-lead ECG. It's a sort of standard um, ECG methodology used in hospitals. Um, so <clears throat> this information is, is collected by the electrodes, and, um, and usually they're displayed in what's called an ECG trace, um, as you can see in the top hand uh, plot. So um, hundreds of variables are typically collected from um, a standard ECG analysis, maybe up to 500 variables in some settings. But what happens often is that cardiologists will actually provide what's called a qualitative assessment of the ECG. So they're trained to look for very specific um, deviations from a normal trace. This is a normal trace. And from that, they'll, they'll assign a qualitative uh, assessment of whether the heart is functioning properly or not and they can tell whether certain things are happening. Um, so there's been some interest in whether um, very subtle signals in the ECG measurements are, are being missed in these qualitative assessments. And so uh, this is not a new hypothesis, but we thought it would be very interesting to test this with a machine learning method and this new variable selection technique that, um, that we've developed. So, uh, and we had plenty of ECG data to work with. Right now, there are over 1.2 million digitized records available at Cleveland Clinic, and we're starting to learn how to harvest this and, and uh, sort of connect it to the different databases that we have. So we put together this um, interesting cohort, about uh, 19,000 patients or so. Um, all of them were suspected of cardiovascular disease. All of them underwent stress testing followed by um, ECGs in which they all had qualitatively normal uh, ECG uh, assessments by a cardiologist. So what we wanted to do was, given these variables, so there were 346 of them, uh, a few of them clinical, I think probably about 12 clinical, and all the rest ECG, could we predict long-term survival and which of the variables were at play? So were, was it all driven by clinical variables or was there something going on in terms of ECG measurements. Um, for the outcome, we used all-cause mortality uh, obtained using the Social Security Index. And um, we had plenty of deaths, about uh, 1,742, a mean follow-up time of uh, 11 years. So here is the first, I'm going to show you the VIMP analysis. And this is what I see over and over and over again in these high-dimensional problems, which um, is one of the reasons I, I have problems with using VIMP in these, in these applications. So, um, here's the importance value in terms of percentage as the number of variables increases. And as you can see, it's this sort of, you know, long tail distribution. You've got, you know, maybe one, two, three, four, five variables that sort of stick out. Uh, and then you've got a, like a lot of variables that have positive VIP. So positive VIP is supposed to indicate a predictive variable. Here's the log of the importance. You can see it a little bit more um, blown up. So here's one, two, three, four, five variables. By the way, one and two and three are, are clinical variables. It's not surprising they come up. But what about all these variables? So they all have positive VIMP. Surely uh, you don't need over 150 variables to predict long-term survival. Where do I draw the threshold? And, and that's the problem. We don't really know how to do that. There's been really no um, progress made on, on uh, developing theory for VIMP. Okay, so here's the analysis that we, um, we showed in our JASA paper. Um, 
On the x-axis is the minimal depth. That's the first order statistic. Uh, on the y-axis, I've also plotted the second order statistic. So that's the depth to the second closest maximal subtree. Um, this big dashed blue line here is the minimal depth threshold. So that's the mean under the null distribution. So all these variables here are, are, are considered to be significant under this thresholding rule. So one, two, and three, age, low heart rate recovery, METs, which is uh, exercise capacity, uh, age adjusted and gender adjusted. And then uh, a bunch of sort of variables that are sort of sitting in the middle and lo and behold, they're all ECG based. Um, what, what I also found very interesting though, so, so the first thing, remember that um, minimal depth is not prediction error based, right? So it's this concept about real estate and it should get at the idea of prediction error, but does it? So what we did was we, we actually fit models sequentially based on the variables that we found in the, in the, and ordered them in terms of minimal depth and then fit the models and looked at their test set performance. So this is the Harrell's concordance error rate. Uh, this is the R squared and CREPS uh, continuous rank probability score, which are Breyer score based methods. And as you can see, you get this either monotonic increase or decrease uh, in prediction error, as you would expect if you had used a measure that was based on prediction error, but we're, we didn't use a measure that was based on prediction error. So we're seeing a nice drop monotonically. And I think also interesting, we were sort of, you could see that the model, the prediction errors are all sort of plateauing around five to 10 or, you know, uh, variables, which is very consistent with what, what we found. 